All right, welcome everybody. We are here and have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Nasha. Uh, Nasha is a, a doctor, an author, a speaker, a researcher, and a cancer thriver herself. So I'm very excited to be able to pick her brain on the things that she's been doing and the, the work she's been doing to impact the cancer world. She's been very influential in our life. We can talk about some of that. But really, in this video, what we want to dive into is what Nasha calls the Terrain 10. I'm going to talk about why this is so important for us all to learn and understand. So welcome, Nasha. It's really good to see you. Oh my gosh, it feels like just yesterday we were doing this and you were telling me it's been almost two years, so we're long <laughs> we overdue for another. It was pre Pre-COVID. Oh gosh, pre pre before the world changed before our very eyes. So it's Seriously. lovely to be back with you. And I, I've been watching what you have been doing oh, um, out there with what you're sharing with the world, the messages. And I love that you're introducing people to different modalities and concepts that are in digestible bits, which is what we're attempting to tackle today. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. We're taking that same model. Perfect, perfect. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk Terrain 10. And this really comes from your, um, I think it's your first book at least, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. At least your your most significant first book, <laughs> I'd say. The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. Um, and that's been out for, when did when did you publish that? It will be five years in May five 2022. Years. Wow. Which blows my mind. It seems like yep. it's just a flash in the pan. So yep. yeah. Uh, and it's impacted a lot of people's lives. Um, I think the reason I want to dive into this is I think, as I've talked with people, um, I think you get a, a, a label of the keto doctor. And, and, I, and I don't think that's what you would label yourself. And, and I don't think that's what the book's about. And so that's why it's like, hey, let's dive in a little bit. Uh, so what is the Train 10? And then let's, let's dive into each one. So when you talk about the Train 10, what do you mean? Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you for, for helping lift the layer, the, the label layer off of me. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I just think that's, it's a, it's just happens, you know, I've been at mm -hmm. this for so long and you get one topic and everyone just kind of puts you in that box. But my passion really has been since the beginning terrain. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is at the time of my own diagnosis, 30 years ago, as of October, 2021, I hit 30 years out from terminal cancer. Congratulations. I know it's so weird. Congratulations. But one of the first things I stumbled upon was the work of this crazy fella, Otto Warburg. And he was really talking about the mitochondria, the cytoplasm in which the mitochondria lived as the real area of interest and focus when uncovering and dealing with a cancer diagnosis. And so because it was so early on in my own, that that resonated with me so much more than what I was learning in my pre-med physiology, biochemistry, anatomy courses, which was very much that cancer is a genetic disease. It's just bad luck and that it is, you know, just, just the way it is. And that there's yeah. this two hit theory that you accumulate enough DNA mutations that one big event can kind of push you over the edge. That was sort of the thought that was happening there. And I recognize that there were some elements of that that held water still, but mm -hmm. it didn't resonate all the way through. So it's not the full picture. Exactly. And that was thanks to that work. I started looking deeper into and stumbled upon the work of Beauchamp which many people was like, let's back that up a couple hundred years, <laughs> which is where we kind of took a divergent path of germ theory, which is what we really, um, you know, kind of subscribe to today in Western medicine and in general medicine, and that it's this external thing that's causing us illness. And Bouchamp, who was a, 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 a fellow uh, practice, you know, physician and researcher of the time of Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, he was saying, no, 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 guys, it's not something from the outside affecting us. It's the inside. It's the soil. It's the milieu. It's the inner terrain in which that organism can take root. And so basically yep. it's the health of the soil within your body that makes you resilient or lots of resilience when it comes to disease. That deeply resonated with me because of my work with Beauchamp and do studying that after learning about Otto Warburg, it led me onto the work of a woman named Dr. Mina Bissell. Like mm. the, like the vacuum cleaner, yeah. she actually has a really famous Ted talk. You've probably posted it to your, to your mm -hmm. followers, but all about the, what she calls the extracellular matrix. 
And so this is, again, someone taking kind of a 1980s, more modern look at the fact that it's not so much the, the tumor or the tumor cell or the nuclei of that cell where the DNA sort of mastermind would be stored. It's sort of what those cells are swimming in. That's the issue. So I say all of that to give you background that we've known this other theory for hundreds, if not thousands of years. We've even had good science to back it for a good hundred year you know, years or so. Yep. And we have even emerging research in the field of Toft theory and um, uh, the, the Stromel theory and all these different theories that are coming around cancer outside of metabolic theory, which takes us all back to what is the cancer cell swimming in and what, how does that communicate? So sometimes you'll hear it as terrain, milieu, extracellular matrix, um, cytoplasm, tumor microenvironment. So I want your listeners to know that there's a lot of different names for this. And we're this talking about all the similar topic and concepts. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you may be looking at some of the studies look very myopically at this topic, and they might be looking for a single target or a single treatment. But in my collective 30 years of being on this journey of saving my own life and supporting tens of thousands of others in exploring and saving their own lives, and now I have the privilege of supporting physicians and supporting their thousands of patients, it's expanding out there in a way that what I've recognized are particular patterns. Mm. I'm just a systems thinker kind of gal. And the standard medical model does not fit the way I think or approach things. Not to say that the standard is wrong. It's just to say that I look at it from a little different view. And what I found, and there are likely many more than just these 10, but I found these sort of 10 common denominators, these sort of 10 drops in the bucket, if you will, those 10 drops that impact the expression of the cytoplasm, the extracellular matrix, the terrain, whatever label you're comfortable calling it. And those 10 drops are, you know, just again, uh, I was just on a podcast earlier today and she calls it something else. And I've got another yeah. colleague, Dr. Anderson calls it something else. And, but we're all pretty close in that there's somewhere between say seven and 10 main contributors to the health and expression of your terrain. Sure. Would you let me just rattle those off? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So the 10 that I've kind of explored for myself and others are the epigenetics, which are the above gene, meaning that yes, genes can play a role, but how we live our lives, how we think, how we eat, how we breathe, um, how we nourish ourselves pushes the expression of those genes or silences the expression of those genes, depending on what is needed in the terrain. And that can be familial. It can be handed down from generations. In fact, there's studies that show that upwards of 12 generations can impact our own genetic expression. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating, right? So yeah. when you look back at like traumas in history, like fam famines or wars or um, other, you know, just human horrors that people experience that can impact us. Yeah. You know, generations later in how our cells express and how our tissues express. So that's really interesting. And we can also, you know, assess today. This wasn't available to us back when I was diagnosed 30 years ago. In fact, I didn't have my own epigenome mapped until about 12, 15 years ago. And that helped me understand where I came from much better, as well as what my strengths and my weaknesses were and how to fortify and create better resilience for myself. So for me, it was a very powerful tool of empowerment, of the yeah. awareness of what are my vulnerabilities and how can I shore them up to make myself more resilient. So epigenetic drop in the bucket of like, where did you come from? Mm -hmm. you know, into this world. Now, there are also things that happen after you're born that can change your epigenetic expression. Those are like acute extreme traumas or uh, toxicant exposures. But those, I kind of push those into other buckets, um, uh, other drops in the bucket. So the next drop in the bucket is metabolic. This is huge, less than 12% of Americans and likely less than 12% of all humans on this planet today are considered yep. metabolically healthy, yep. right? And by that, I mean that you are um, not rusting your innards and causing a lot of unnecessary aging process to your cells and your tissues, which is what we get when we eat too many carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. When we are eating a lot of oxidized foods, a lot of inflammatory foods, we, we age ourselves. We cause, cause these things called glycosylated end products. And you can measure that. You can quantify that within yourself with a test called a hemoglobin A1C. 
And how funny that labs, you've heard me talk about this before, but labs are based on the average of the population and we're not a healthy right. population. So right. you don't want to be average, right? You don't so, want to be average. Yeah. Exactly. So we are telling people that a 5.6 hemoglobin A1C is average and that that's a good number to um, to go, go for. And yet by the time you reach 5.6, you're already diabetic, right? You're already frying your, your innards. You're already aging your process and rusting drastically inside. So the metabolic functioning is about what kind of fuel are you putting in? How is your body utilizing that fuel? And how is it helping your, your anti-aging mitochondria either respire, like breathe well, or suffocate and die? Yeah. And those are really important things to consider as well. So that drop of the bucket is a huge one that really impacts all of us today. Number three is toxicants. I already alluded to that, but it's no longer a matter of if you're toxic, it's how bad is it? And how does your epigenetic blueprint interface with it? How do your diet and lifestyle choices interface with it? And how do the other drops in the bucket interface with it? So my husband, for instance, he loves the smell of diesel. Like it takes him back to his like farm boy days, like yeah, loves the yeah. smell of the tractor. I get immediately nauseous and a massive uh, migraine the second I smell it. Interesting. It's really interesting. And I've learned about myself that I miss, I'm missing a few of these glutathione snips that mm. my body doesn't know what to do with that chemical. So if yeah. you're someone like me who walks down a particular aisle at say Home Depot, I have to avoid those aisles. They make me ab like sick, sick, sick. Yeah. And then I have other pe people who are like, love their Febreze and they've got their little prime thing hanging in front of the mirror in their car and they're loading up on all the body, you know, body yep, shop yep. chemicals. And they don't even, you know, they don't even know they're like a fragrance factor factory. Those folks have a different, they likely have stronger, robust detoxification pathways, but we're all wired a bit differently. So our toxicant exposure is huge and we need to start to do our own um, evaluation. You can put your zip code in, you can know what your air quality is, your water quality, your soil quality. You can know what industries you live near. You can know what super fun sites you live near. And that helps start to empower people to recognize that while you might live in a beautiful place, but it could actually be a very big toxic hot dump. You know, yeah. so we, we live on a, on an 800 acre farm wow. and they're raising beef uh, and they are non-organic mm -hmm. For the most part, they're they're better probably than most because they're they're more of like a niche small yeah. farm. Okay. Uh, but we definitely have times of the year where you walk outside and you go, "That's fertilizer." Just yes. there it is, just yep. in your nose. You know, you're just soaking in it. And, and it. Exactly, and it's like that's just what you smell. But forget about right. the billions of mouths on the surface of your skin. Yep. You yep. know, or in the surface of your of your colon as you're ingesting those things and the levels of dioxin in the soil and the water of a, even yep. a boutique small farm, you know, those are really known carcinogens and we take those for granted. So those types of things we have to evaluate. Then we look at the microbiome. I mean, a mm -hmm. few years ago, doctors made fun of naturopaths when we said it all starts in the gut. Um, and today that's where we're funneling all of our research dollars. We've even learned that basically your pharmaceuticals don't work as well if your microbiome is altered. Oh, that's we definitely have seen very yeah. interesting. We actually have multiple studies have come out this year alone in latter to 2021 and 20, early 2022 of showing that immune therapies and other uh, chemotherapies are less effective if the microbiome is altered. And so we start to look at that. We start to yeah. say, gosh, this is really a key player. We look at the in, um, um, immune system. My goodness, again, something as a pandemic is raging across the world. Yeah. I think that we're dealing with bigger pandemics, but um, they all come back to how well is our immune system functioning? Those three R's I talk about. Um, is your body able to re, re, um, like recognize the organism? Is it able to respond to it appropriately, not over, you know, over zestfully or under, mm -hmm. and is it able to remember it if it sees it again? So you're hearing of these things today, like yeah. certain recurrences of cancer types or recurrences of certain viruses, even when you've been inoculated or chemotherapied out the wazoo, yeah. then why is that coming back? Well, there's some dis. This, you know, discourse within the three R's of helping the body recognize that. So we look at those drops in the bucket and we look at things like the inflammatory system. 
Okay. We look at things like the hormonal milieu, like how balanced are your hormones? It's not about having excess or deficient. It's how are they in response to one another and how does your body utilize, bring them into the receptor sites, use them, and then discharge them and discard them when it's done what it needed to with them instead of storing it up in inappropriate ways. And then we look at circadian rhythm, which is also our stress response and how we handle our stress response, because it's not about getting away from stress because it's just part of living on the planet today. It's how does your body personally deal with it? And then the big, big, big one that no one likes to talk about sort of the, uh, the elephant in the living room is the emotional, the mental mm-hmm. health component. Yeah. And I've heard you speak to this and that mental health component also, um, wraps around even our, our connection to other, our connection yeah. to self, our connection to our loved ones, our communities, um, our, our, our places of faith, of worship, of all of these things. It's like, where, where does that tie into this. So we look at those 10 drops very carefully and we evaluate, we have a questionnaire that helps people understand what are their priorities in those 10 drops in the bucket and how that is impacting the expression of their extracellular matrix. Mm -hmm. And that's where we start with folks because we're all wired differently. We all have different pressure points um, and pain points in our lives that led to something um, expressing in a way that is not desired. Yeah. It, it, makes so much sense Hmm. it feels ridiculous that we haven't already been talking about this (laughs) (laughs) but we have like that's what's well that that's true that's true right that that society holistically has not been talking about this and thinking about cancer not as a a singular virus right you might have a singular virus you might have a singular um, treatment that could be developed for that singular virus sure But thinking of cancer in that same way, it still blows my mind that our standard of care is chemotherapy, surgery, uh, and radiation. And and the differences between those, like like chemotherapy, Mm -hmm. there are some some targeted treatments, but for the most part, we talked to, you know, 16 different people with 16 different cancers, and they were on the same protocol that Rachel's been on, uh, you know, on, on the chemo side. And you go, oh, it's not as targeted as... It yeah. sounds, <laughs> you right. kind of go cancer. Yes. I guess we're just, we're going to pump you full of this and see what happens. Right. Right. Um, they like so an algorithm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the amazing thing is when you know, when you learn things like, let's just use chemo as a very good example mm-hmm. and we'll just be, we'll keep it broad stroke. So it doesn't matter what yeah. cancer type. So if you bring on chemo and you bring it into a body that is dealing with insulin resistance, that's dealing with mm-hmm. metabolic imbalances, the chemo and even radiation does not land as effectively. The mm-hmm. cancer cells are less, um, are more resistant to the treatment mm-hmm. when they're high, dealing with high glycemia, high insulinemia. They are uh, more, they create more uh, resistance in general. So the drug loses its effectiveness quicker. Okay, yep. so that's one example. Then let's take a look at, okay, well, vitamin D. If you're taking a certain chemotherapy and your vitamin D levels are low, you tend to have less of a response to that. We've actually found this to be very true in the literature with immune therapies in general. So whether it's like the Keytruda's, the Opdivo checkpoint inhibitor drugs, or even things like mistletoe or low dose naltrexone in the integrative medical world. But even today, we're finding in the the basics of even a, a COVID vaccine that if your vitamin D levels are low, it's like those vaccines, those treatments, those immune therapies don't have something to land on. The vitamin yeah. D and the vitamin D receptor site is very important for how well those therapies are integrated into the body. And then also when you have elevated insulin and, and metabolic issues, you have elevated um, growth factors, mm-hmm. um, specifically insulin growth factors, which is relevant in over 70% of cancers. Some studies mm-hmm. say as much as 90% of cancers. Wow. Yeah. So that means that like every time you ingest a little bit, but oh, it's just a little bit of my, you know, I just had a little bite of my kid's birthday cake, or I just had this extra banana at my breakfast. Like it, it adds up. And each time it's like you flick that little switch, you flick a little growth factor that your body makes a choice. Then it's like, I'm going to use this to grow a cancer cell versus nourish other parts of my body. And yep. then we know that, that that much sugar in the body also kicks up inflammation. And when you have an elevated C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation, you are considered poor prognosis for all cancers. Hmm. Poor prognosis. Because yeah. a CRP is prognostic, and it also tells you how well the patient's going to respond to the chemo. It's going to tell you how quickly the patient's going to recur or progress. It's going to tell you how quickly those patients are going to have a resistance to that medication. And it's going to be a marker of overall mortality. 
So hmm. you need to be looking at that. There's that. Yeah. In our immune markers, we talked about vitamin D, but if a patient has a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio that's skewed, meaning a lot of neutrophils and not very many lymphocytes, that is indicative of all case mortality, cancer or not. So that's a problem saying your immune system isn't doing its job. And if you bring in those therapies to a system that has a poor NLR, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, those therapies have less impact. So these are the things that somebody like myself, an expert in integrative oncology, we're looking at all the parameters, the metrics of the drops in your bucket, and we're tuning you up. We're getting your vitamin D levels optimized. We're getting your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio optimized. We're bringing down your CRP. We're bringing down your insulin and your insulin growth factor. We're making you metabolically flexible. We're making sure we're addressing all of the toxicant exposures in your life. We're screening mm. for what you're being exposed to. We're getting a good house water filter system. We're getting you know an air an in house air filter system if that's necessary. We're oh, helping plastics out of your kitchen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Slowly replacing things so you're taking yeah. more and more burden off so that your body has more and more resilience and resources to deal with what it's being faced with the cancer itself, but also the cancer treatments. And I mean that even specifically, if you're going totally alternative, because high dose IV vitamin C is just as thrashing on the body's oxidative stressors as chemotherapy as off-label drugs. So it doesn't matter what soup du jour you chose for the treatment. If the terrain is not ready to receive it, and it utilize won't. it in the proper way, it's a wasted treatment. Yeah, yeah. Again, makes a crazy amount of sense. <laughs> so there you have it. So um, but before we wrap this up, yeah, where would you suggest, just to get really practical, sure. someone start? They're seeing this video, they're hearing about you for the first time, yeah. and this approach for the first time. Um, what's like the, the checklist? Do these three things first? Sure. Sure. Well, this is not meant to be a big plug for the book, but the book really is a good place to start. And if you have folks that don't even have the money to afford the book, um, then I'm happy to send them a copy of the questionnaire, right? I want them to do their personal audit, their personal inventory, take the 10 part questionnaire to assess the 10 drops in your bucket and define your priority. And with that priority, start there. Start with the first one, two, or three priorities and read, focus on those chapters alone and then start to implement. I literally get letters every single day from people from all over the world saying, I just focused on the first priority that came up and it already made a difference. My lab values are already improving. My tumor burden is already better. My quality of life is already better. My relationship to myself and others is already better. Mm -hmm. That was not, that did not involve anything but a $20 cost of a book and then taking it on their own. So that's a really an, an easy place to start, but really start to look in your cupboards, look under your sink, look in your medicine cabinet, look in your refrigerator and your freezer and start to really say, did that come from a factory or did that come from a farm? You know, and then looking at that even further, like does it, do, would, if I can't pronounce what I'm putting on my skin, should I be putting it on my skin? Right, right. Right. If, if my HOA thinks I'm safer by spraying the bejesus out and having a beautiful green lawn than having a couple dandelions, I probably need to look at moving. I mean, there's just things like that that you have to start to consider because no one else is going to do it for you. You have to show up for yourself and your family first. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. And you're right. It's not a, not a plug for the book, but you poured your heart out into 30 years, all the research and your experience yeah. into yeah. a book. Yeah. So it and makes sense that, that would be a place to start. Exactly. That, the fact that it's almost five years out and it still is relevant. Mm-hmm. And Jess and I have been debating on whether to write an updated edition. And we're realizing the, the, the information is coming at us so fast. By the time we'd get the next manuscript in for an update, it would already be obsolete. So instead, yeah. we're updating with classes and, and podcasts and interviews. And we're creating little programs and little updates and keeping people engaged in our newsletters as we share our information. My website is loaded. DrNasha.com is loaded with tons and tons and tons of free um, podcasts and interviews and things yeah. that I've done in blogs. It's constant. My goal is to educate and empower people. And that doesn't take much. Like that's not a, a it's an investment of my time and my experience. But for you as a consumer, it's free for you. It's available yeah. to you. It's just like what you're creating here with these lectures you're doing. It's, it's an incredible resource that I hope people keep tapping into and just getting curious and getting, um, you know, self-involved to make those changes for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, uh, Nisha, thank you very much for spending the time to go through the Terrain 10. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, they can always comment below or reach out and we can get in touch with Nisha or I'm, I'm sure that uh, if, if we get a lot of questions, maybe we can bring her back for another video, uh, just Bye. answering questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nisha. You're so welcome. Thank you, everyone.